Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for acknowledging uh, Dr. Stacy here and I'm sure uh, Amy, I think they're also part of the seminar, I guess. So uh, as uh, Stacy mentioned, I am the founder of uh, Air Robotic Systems. Uh, we are a Newton based company. And my own specialty, before I started Aero, it was Korean. I started another company mainly for uh, micro nano sensors and analytical instrumentation. Um, that company um, went very well and it's still going on. We are exporting our products worldwide when I started, uh, when I started investing in robotics. And then we came across a lot of interesting problems, challenges, um, results. So I thought to share some of with, some of those with you guys and uh, also learn from you and see uh, how this whole session goes. Um, so I would like to put a disclaimer over here that I'm not here to teach you AI, I'm not to uh, even explore the stuff this level. I know that this whole room is full of people who so you know a lot better on AI and machine learning than I do. Um, however, uh, my whole objective of, of speaking today is to introduce you to the, the world where AI needs uh, to be used, and especially in the industrial environments. That is the whole focus of existence of AI. We are developing industrial machines which are autonomous, based on AI, based on data. And so basically it is, it is all, it's less about teaching you AI and more about basically making you aware of in what kind of scenarios uh, we are using uh, robotics and uh, AI just together. Uh, let me move on over here if I can push this guy. Good. So, and for, for the next couple of minutes, I'll, I'll be telling you some of the narrative of, of robotics and this is one of the recent events by UN. They invited robots at a conference, at a, at a press conference, uh, except one human uh, over, over here. Uh, everyone is a robot over here. And they were, they were uh, answering people's questions. They had uh, enough intelligence. They had uh, enough uh, uh, spectral strength that they were there. And you can, you can see some of the half life over there. But yeah. Uh, so that means that this this whole world of robotics, basically marrying AI and robotics, is moving forward very quickly. But there are a lot of underlying technologies, uh, including engineering, computer science, and software, and so much. So, but this is not what we are doing. This is a specific um, area of development, especially human and robots. Uh, that there are a couple of companies uh, that are really leading the the way it's going. Uh, our whole focus is basically to participate and to automate industrial operations where humanoid robots, uh, they are uh, many companies, especially Century AI uh, out of BC, they are planning, but uh, still humanoid robots will be having similar limitations that humans have. And then the humans invented a wheel and put basically bigger load, uh, more dexterity into wheel machine. So it, it would be similar analogies over here. So what our company is being is basically more on you know, the robots on the wheels. And just to give you a little bit more introduction of uh, where that industry is, Amazon bought a robotics company and uh, called, uh, called Kiva Robots. Uh, now they have over half a million robots across the world uh, throughout their various uh, areas. So that means you can see that these specific uh, purpose robots, uh, now at, at Amazon, you might've seen some videos, literally these robots move their shelves from one point to another and they can arrange the shelves in a way that you know, the cards can be found much quicker. However, those robots are not general purpose. And this is where our company found a gap. And uh, then we found out that this is, Amazon has very specific problem to solve and they are very good at that. But general industry, like this one, it's, it's, a, it's an image of a warehouse. You can see a lot of boxes are there. Um, things are not so much organized. I mean, this is a stock photo, so this looks very clean, but real warehouses are not as good as it looks over here. Uh, same is the case. Uh, so what kind of problems are here? They need to count boxes. They need to clean floors. Uh, they need to avoid hitting anyone uh, over there because the robots need to work among humans. They cannot really create fences and put on the robots. So, so there are a lot of um, dynamic requirements and those requirements keep changing continuously. A manufacturing environment, uh, you can see some, some specific areas where um, no one is supposed to put any kind of objects. However, that's not really the reality. The employees really keep putting objects over there. I'll show you uh, another example later on. So how the robots can work over here, and as I told you, and I'm gonna 
Here you have some example that robots need some intelligence to, to work in this kind of environment. Again, this, this environment uh, is, is, uh, seems to be very organized. We are working with various manufacturers and they are really not organized as you see that these pallets are sitting at one place, literally pallets are just scattered all around and uh, at, at the busy time, there is a chaos all over. Uh, another example, those companies do need to move materials and many of them are uh, basically putting uh, humans on stake mainly because uh, they don't have access to easy and affordable robotics, which means uh, instead of spending half a million dollars in buying a couple of robots for these different applications, they really have people in our center. Uh, new board. And then um, because we work directly with industry and we work, uh, we deal with the WCB cases with them. So it's a fairly serious condition that they are putting uh, people uh, and they're jeopardizing their, their safety. Uh, clinic floors, uh, literally, even as of today here in Edmonton, humans, uh, they're in regular employees who are doing some different tasks where in the morning we have to basically mop the floor uh, of a bigger scale. But this is this seems to be a smaller level, but some companies do have people. Uh, if that person is a uh, dispatcher or receiving boxes for the building, their job in the money could be really mopping the floor, uh, which is not, uh, which should not be the case because already we have such a shortage of uh, labor. So those people need to be uh, engaged in more creative and, and uh, engaging jobs rather than you know asking them to clean floors. Um, chemical disinfectants, spraying chemicals, another problem where robots uh, can play an important role. Um, uh, inventory, I mentioned to you, whenever things are done manually, even, even I mean, when this is a, a scanner, which is basically whenever it takes data, it puts the data back to the, the, the database and there's a bit of automation, but still human is there to move around. And so a lot of errors are introduced. Another uh, problem, uh, painting, we are working with another company in this school, they, are, they need to paint uh, pipes. Again, the problem is how a robot is going to find out the way the pipe is, how big the pipe is. Uh, how close they need to get in, and those things cannot be done uh, without uh, a complex combination of sensors, uh, engineering, and AI in there. Uh, good. So what we are, so we developed a platform which is basically multitasking, which means a single platform can perform multiple different tasks when we carefully combine various different technologies. Uh, when it has nothing to do, uh, so when it has not, no, no attachment on it, it can literally be used for internal logistics. It can be used for, for uh, to move the boxes. This is where most of our competition industry is. However, companies cannot, you know, companies before we came, companies need to buy another robot to basically clean their clothes. But that's not the case with us because with us, literally, they need to put another attachment. I'm going to show you an image on the next slide. And they can put an attachment and they can. Uh, use the same robot which was moving the boxes during the daytime. At the night, it can start cleaning the floor. Uh, chemical sprays, <clears throat> it can uh, spray chemicals. It can move shelves from a stock room with, with various parts. Um, it can do equipment monitoring. Uh, some examples are coming up on that. Uh, 3D profiling. Um, uh, again, I'll, I'll possibly show you some examples where we needed to introduce enough intelligence into the robot so that it can literally per do 3D profiling or digital twin, as some of you may know. Uh, and then a lot more um, applications and uh, ideas are there. I'd like to uh, highlight over here that if any of you have any question or uh, comment, uh, please uh, come up. Uh, I would not like to keep it more like a monologue. And let's keep it a dialogue. And we'll, we'll just discuss uh, right in the middle of these uh, slides. Okay, so I showed you- one really quick? Sorry. Just if I'm not familiar with the phrase, what is, what is 3D profiling? Uh, 3D profiling means that um, in, the, in the old days, you had to have a computer and had to create a 3D map of this uh, table, uh, 3D model actually, not okay, or SolidWorks or some other. But now new technologies are there. The humans take a scanner, they, they go around this object, and within uh, probably 10, 15 seconds, they can literally create a 3D model of this thing. And now you, you, companies can use the 3D model of their bigger machine as products into various different settings. Uh, which means they can use uh, for further uh, recreation of those models or uh, editing those. Uh, they can, uh, at a smaller level, complete the 3D printing. So 3D profiling or 3D imaging is basically creating a 3D model of any object. And at industry level, it has to happen because I'll show you something like this. Okay, so uh, a robot which can move boxes during the daytime and with another attachment, 
loaded on it, it can clean the floor. And literally the main engine is this one underneath. And after that, they will just get attachments. We are manufacturing robotic arms. And this arm will show you some of the uh, work we are doing towards AI. And this robotic arm and this black box, uh, this literally comes separate. And then this thing comes separate and this thing comes like this or like this. Uh, robotic arms, uh, they can uh, have various different degrees. So they have cameras, uh, 3D profiling I mentioned to you. Literally, they, we can attach a 3D uh, scanner over here and it can do some scanning. Uh, chemical sprays, uh, this was, we had a plan to deploy this uh, robot at Heritage Festival as well as KDA, basically it could move uh, outside in the parking and uh, where people are walking and it could uh, mist water. Uh, however, um, these robots are really not made for outdoors. They're mainly for indoor environments, for bigger uh, warehouses and floors. So we, uh, we we were a little bit concerned about training, so we didn't deploy it. But this is this could be application. Uh, moving the shelves, uh, how a robot knows that how to align itself under the shelf, and then dock to the shelf or take the shelf to another uh, location into a building. Uh, imagine this is a complex environment and they're building a machine over here, but the parts are sitting at a different corner. Now you need to, there are two options. One is that you have a trained technician who's busy there and you ask them, hey, can you go and basically take a card and pick up all the parts from the stock room? Or basically you take our tablet and press a couple of buttons and ask the robot, go there. The shelf is already ready with the part, literally drag the shelf over there. What would be the challenge? The robot has to align itself to the shelf, first of all, because there's no human over there. Once it has aligned, once it has detected all the uh, all the edges of the head, then it, it needs to dock, and then it needs to find out its way to go to the location where it came from. Uh, good. So that was basically some some narrative, some some um, some introduction of the company why and what we are doing. And now coming to how we are using this technology, robotics and AI towards uh, industry 4.0. If, if some of you don't know um, the specific term, this is basically if you should look on Google, like industry 1.0, 2, 3, and 4. So, you know, there was an industrialization time about 100 years back, and there was an industry 3.0. 4.0 is more about this image over here, where industrial operations are being supported by heavy involvement of robotics, sensors, Internet of Things. Your machines are connected to the Internet. They're collecting large amount of data, and you are basically uh, dependent on the data to make important decisions. And how this kind of, uh, we just try to fit this robot over here. So how our robot fits into this environment, and that is basically that what kind of common tasks they need to perform. And, you know, one of the very common tasks is cleaning. Equipment, they need to monitor the equipment, how each equipment is uh, being basically, what is the performance, what is, whether one of the specific equipment is creating enough heat, uh, handling materials, uh, inventory management. So now, all of these tasks are regularly performed by humans, and humans cannot do it without having their brain active, without having any kind of intelligence. What happens is that, first of all, when you bring a new employee to your, your building, you need to make them aware of what, what is where and what to do. So that means they need to collect enough data through their sensor, through the eyes, to learn about the environment so that the manager told them, hey, the, this specific machine uh, is, is dangerous, so don't come, go in front of it, but just find your way around the boxes that are over there. So, you know, they're continuously collecting the data and they're storing the data and then they're basically processing the data. The same is the case with this robot when this is going to operate in various different environments. But when the single machine has to perform so many different tasks, the level of AI goes to a different level. That means that now we need to, uh, there are literally separate companies doing, some companies are doing only cleaning robots. They don't need to do anything else. Some are doing only uh, equipment monitoring. Uh, and then um, inventory management, I showed you the specific scanner. So we, where we came into is that we tried to combine all of these technologies onto this one single platform. And the level of uh, complexity was unfortunately to a level that uh, took us multiple years to reach uh, where we are now. So I'm gonna show you a video of a similar environment. Can I ask you uh, a question? Yes, sir. Um, that picture clearly shows robots before humans. Do you envision a situation where there should be robots with other robots? Or do you think there have to be humans in the same environment? They have to be, I mean, you, you cannot eliminate humans. They have to be there. Uh, I'll show you one uh, video. I hope we uh, have something. Uh, there was a time when these robots, especially these robots, even now at Amazon and uh, auto industry, they are working behind the fences. Humans are not allowed to come close because those robots are not cobots. 
basically. And the, the small robotic arms, they do come as cohorts, which means that if, as soon as it, it touches you, it points over, I hit something and it stops. Mm -hmm. However, now the requirement is the robots need to work with humans, among humans, instead of replacing human jobs, they need to augment the, the, the team capability, which means that you, you cannot say, hey, I'm gonna kick out this specific employee because the robot has, uh, has come over there. Because the same employee can be doing something better. Instead of you know moving the materials up, the robots cannot drive a forklift, and robots cannot lift enough what a forklift can do. So the forklift press are this kind of operation, they still need to be there. But robots can do menial tasks. And what is menial over here? For example, uh, if I give you some examples, so these are made of wood. And they, they keep the, the tiny pieces of wood keep breaking and they keep coming on the floor. And these, these wheels basically pick up those small pieces. Our robot is going to sense that there's a piece sitting on the floor. How is it going to sense that I need to grab that piece from the floor? And then while I need to be careful that there are other tasks over there as well, which I need to perform. And of course, bigger companies, they're going to have multiple of these platforms, which means inter robotics communication. But a single robot has to literally perform just like another human. Because it has to work among humans and it needs to be just like a manager. A manager has to be careful about all those tasks plus, plus another big list which they need to be careful about. So similarly, but the way we are designing our robots is that they need to be careful about all those tasks. So they need to know, hey, cleaning is done, but maybe there's another cleaning session coming up, but can I finish equipment monitoring and uh, moving materials before that, before the other cleaning session comes up. And uh, so that is, that's, a, that's the whole focus of our software development where, uh, because robot itself is literally a, a mechanical piece actually, but the intelligence goes in the form of software. Uh, so here's a video. Uh, we can possibly play it. Uh, uh, yeah, there you go. I turned off my uh, audio over here. So a robot was coming to move the boxes. Someone threw um, a, a garbage container. It found its way without bothering any human. And it's just moving throughout uh, this facility. Um, I'm having a little bit uh, shrinkage of the screen over here. You can't see all of the components that I see on my screen. But you can still see uh, a kind of environment. You know, in that illustration, we did not see something like this. So some they, they were doing some renovation. Someone started. Um, uh, putting all those cameras over here. So the robot needed to be aware of that. So that it needs to move all around. And uh, let's see how, how uh, long this video is. But you can you can see this environment looks not super clean. You see that some of the objects are over here. Uh, some of the objects we just noticed the other day that there was, now you see this yellow line and you see already an object sitting over there. So the robot has to avoid all that. So, but while it's doing that, it has to collect a huge amount of data, which means that now, uh, yeah, I think it's coming up to this level. So, oops, sorry, I, I jumped quickly. Yeah. So, in this environment, first it is moving the boxes. But just like once once you ask a human that they move from that end to this end, that specific employee is not just going to move the boxes, but that's also going to do observation on the way. So, this robot also needs to collect data that how many objects. I found on my way, which were basically not supposed to be there, but still they are there. So that means data collection. And once that data has been collected throughout the year, at the end of the year, it can literally present a report, which is weekly basis. But at the end of the year, the management can find out what was the really the reason that our employees were putting all those objects where they were not supposed to be. So what could be the variables over there? Could it be just that there were lack of employees over there or lack of policies or uh, lack of uh, uh, carefulness. So, you know, there are so many different variables, but the main source of data is basically the robot, which is roaming all around into a busy environment and still finding out uh, very important pieces of data and basically stitching them together. Uh, how that data uh, is utilized toward AI, uh, I, I'll touch uh, briefly on that. However, as I told you that we will not be going into the technicalities, but mainly towards uh, where many of you can find out that your academic projects, uh, research work or industrial work, where can that be used towards industrial problems? And as I, as I showed you one, one of the problems over here, that this is not just a, a problem of autonomy or making an autonomous robot, but it is here what, what I showed you that it's more about making a, a, a smart and intelligent robot. Uh, okay. 
Now, in this kind of environment, what could be a typical scenario? Literally, an operator can, without touching any kind of touch screen, it can say, hey, robot, or hey, arrow, this, this is what we are building now based on um, uh, large language models and uh, chat GPT's uh, technology. That instead of asking them that now what they need to do is that they have a small tablet and they have to press a couple of buttons, but they can literally speak to a robot and ask them, that, can you go to the, uh, the reception where boxes have been delivered? And can you, someone will just load you and then bring the boxes. But if you have your own Roboticon, just load the boxes yourself. And the robot literally understands that because we have integrated some of the uh, tech over there. And it goes there because it knows where the reception is and it, it's autonomous. But what happens is that it comes across a puddle, a water, a chemical, and now it has to make a decision. But what is more important? Is it, is it more important for me to go and pick up the boxes or is it more important for me to report this puddle? and clean this one up before I go and pick up the boxes. And this is where the state of our technology is. And because if it goes through the puddle, then we would have en enough learning done to the robot that you will slip over there because you're gonna lose your mutation and you're gonna slip over there and your sensor may get confused at you. So instead of, especially if it is oil or some other chemical, imagine if there is some, some hazardous or corrosive chemical and that chemical may damage the material itself. So, through that, that, that big level of learning, this machine is going to find out that I think the dealing with this puddle is more important. Now, <clears throat> how to find out, for example, this attachment which I showed you, the scrubber, <clears throat> that's, that attachment can be loaded on the robot and it can literally suck up all the water. But what if it is not water? What if it is certain chemical and the robot sends a wrong report to the manager that I detected a puddle on my way, I was going to pick up the boxes, but there's something more important to handle. And that's water, but imagine this is not water. This is oil, which, which means that it should not be loaded into, into the scrubber attachment. So that has to come through a standoff sensor, which means that we are developing another technology where a, a robot literally can shoot a laser and collect some information back, and it can find out what is the chemical nature of that, uh, that liquid. It's more ambitious project. However, uh, it would be able to detect certain materials from a distance and find out whether it needs to request the scrubber attachment, or it needs to request uh, a bigger uh, recovery operation for, for this kind of accident. And these this, uh, accidents, they do happen continuously in various companies uh, at, at uh, various levels. So this is a kind of um, a problem which exists in the industry and uh, all of the bright minds over here, um, especially the, the researchers uh, from machine learning, AI, uh, this is kind of a problem where you need to uh, dive into and develop uh, certain ways. I know our company is uh, at the forefront of solving this problem, but this is not just one company or one problem. Literally, there are millions of companies of this type across the world, and all of them are very similar problems. Uh, another problem in the industry, moving parts from one machine to another machine. So I, sh I showed you that, uh, that, uh, that problem, that the illustration for the industry environments. Most of the machines are working uh, they're just doing a, a, a tiny portion of the job, and then another machine needs to take over. But someone has to come and pick up that part from there and move to the next machine. So that means that part is not going to, that job is not, it doesn't have to be done 100% of the, of the time throughout the day. It, it is a menial task. No one wants to basically enjoy that. They still need to go because the boss asks that they go and pick up this part and load to this machine. So that means instead of disturbing or distracting the employees over there, literally these robots can go and pick up one part from this machine and move to this one. For example, in this case, we are working with this company, so they uh, they, they need to move parts to the to their 3D profilers. Uh, these, these profiling machines, are, they, they can basically uh, find out the quality control of those different, different uh, manufacturing parts. And instead of asking, uh, distracting the, the, the regular employees, and this can literally be done through a robot. How a robot is going to detect it, that is through computer vision. I'll show you some of the examples where we have implemented AI into computer vision uh, and then found out that how you can detect certain parts. And we are just progressing uh, on that one. Uh, so this was another case for, for to use uh, AI in um, robotics. Hospital operations. Uh, uh, a situation like this where patients leave a bed, they leave a lot of sickness, a lot of bugs on the beds as well. And there's one real thing is called hospital-acquired infections. 
when people, I mean, you go to hospital, our, our, our regular nurses there, especially during COVID, this was more intense actually, that nurses were regularly picking up um, sickness uh, from, from the patient themselves. And one of the cases is when, when, a, when a patient leaves, then all of these uh, boundary that has to be taken care of. So what, what happens nowadays is that uh, nurses literally need to go and handle that, uh, that operation. But that doesn't have to be done anymore because uh, our robots can literally take care of that. And they, we are developing a certain part of the technology where they can detect how big the, the bed sheet is and where the pillow is, and they can detect the, the, the boundaries and they can find out, oh, I need to pick up a pillow and need to put up uh, into a basket. So we have a small demo over here. Uh, let me see if I can play this video. Uh, I think it has to be done over here. And so we demonstrated, um, uh, so you see, we put a hand, this is coming from another local robotics company. We put it on uh, our hand onto uh, this one. They're developing really dexterous robotics hand. They're called the Circumair Dynamics. So we put that hand on our arm as an attachment. And so this is the way we were demonstrating that how it is going to detect the, the, the bed sheet. And uh, just like human hand, it literally just folds around the, the bed sheet and it picks up and it, it knows how far the, the basket was placed and uh, then it drops over there. So this was, uh, this is just early stage uh, operation, uh, demo. And we are doing quite, uh, quite a bit of work uh, with Nate and with a couple of the partners. And again, over here, the robot needs to deal with so many different variables. In a hospital, when the patient leaves, they need to coordinate with regular staff. Uh, they need to ask whether they can enter a room. And once they have uh, handled this kind of uh, situation, then they, they need to uh, inform the other uh, staff because the robots cannot solve every problem. Like there's a, you know, there's a misunderstanding that robots are going to make people jobless and they can take all of their, their jobs. Just like a PC, robots can solve every problem. They are made for very specific applications. Even once, once you equip with them with, with uh, certain advanced hands, platforms, arms, all of that, still they are made for very specific applications. So this is really, you know, people like you guys over here who are interested in AI, AI and possibly robotics as well. So you guys need to make them smart enough that they can do that specific task good enough, better than humans. So that basically they make humans life a little better instead of having infections being spread just because someone could not have robotics over there. So that means that we can easily uh, engage the robotics over there. Uh, I can take any question before I go to my next uh, example over there, if there is any question. Yes, sir. You have a, you have a human-like hand. Maybe the cost has how people design them, but I always think you have the right type of device to actually pick up a sheet. I'm not sure this is the right device. Is that like a better design for it? Could be. You know, our hand has so many limitations. Yeah. And, yeah. and when we looked at their technology, we started feeling that we really keep our, we, we, we take our hands for granted. Our hands are so complex. And so they are working like the, the, the local company, Sertum and Dynamics, they are working very hard to make these hands in a way for, so they're, they're making one special design for, for various different applications, but you are right, maybe the, we need six finger hands, or maybe we need uh, three finger hands. Okay. So, you know, that, that is part of uh, the whole learning and investigation that in what specific uh, scenarios, what kind of paper and effect that we need. Uh, there are companies that literally have this kind of paper and they just go, they're simple, uh, literally go and pick up. However, that's what we figured out that this, this sheet was, in this specific case, the bed sheet was, you know, this crumbled up and then uh, it could basically be picked easily, but imagine the sheet is just, spread throughout the bed. The, the, imagine the scenario when we get out of our bed in the morning and we don't care how we are leaving the sheet, the bed sheet over there. Same is the case when a patient leaves. But the robot needs to come and detect, especially if we have this kind of uh, situation where the background is white as well and your main target is white as well. So the robot has to detect it and needs to grab the sheet and pick up. In this case, uh, because this was just a demo, so there were some control variables. But in a, literally in real life, uh, the sheet may be just sitting on the other side, or side of the bed, actually. It may not be literally placed on the bed itself. So the robot has to come and detect it. Well, there was supposed to be a bed sheet, but it's not there. So let's go around and find it. So there are multiple um, issues. And this is, imagine, I mean, we are at a stage where you can ask Chad GPT to, to write a whole blog for you. But still, uh, robotics and teaching robots is still a huge challenge. 
And unlike chatbots, the robots have to deal with real world. And there are so many different things. And in this specific case, uh, just at the, the level of detection of, uh, of an object and picking it up is challenging, but dealing with uh, a complex environment of a hospital, <clears throat> imagine them because patients are slow and they are not uh, responsive so quickly. So if, if a robot enters there and how a patient is uh, psychologically, they're gonna respond to them. And based on that, how they're gonna, um, they can, they can cooperate with the robots because they have to come and uh, disinfect the room and take care of the bed sheets. So there are so many different variables and th th that's the reason that it's so hard to teach robots. And this is where what we are doing is that we are just taking one specific task. For example, this specific hand was available and we thought, okay, let's make this an operation and let's learn from that. Uh, we did some tasks then, but uh, using the same hand to move uh, this kind of part from one machine to another machine, but I, the example which I gave you that hand may not really fit over there. There we may need some suction gripper or something else. So, you know, uh, there are companies that are only doing grippers. Uh, Robotique uh, out of uh, Montreal, uh, Quebec, I guess. Um, they, they are only doing grippers. And they're not even doing hands, you know. I mean, there's so much uh, demand for just general grippers that how well you can uh, lift an object like the like owl over there or some other uh, shapes. And companies like us, we, our aim is basically to develop a platform just like an iPhone and then bring other companies into the ecosystem and they bring their technologies like a hand and even, even the robotic arms. In this case, we had to develop our own because of certain technical uh, difficulties with other companies. However, our whole agenda is basically to bring various different companies into this thing. Uh, yes, any other questions so far? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a question. Like, what is the weight constraint of your robot? Like, how much you can put up on it or how much it can lift it? Yeah. And another thing is uh, uh, how you are dealing with the learning task. Are you using TinyML or using the help of a cloud? Thank you. Yeah, so this, this base platform, this can lift up to 120 kilograms. Uh, so, for example, this whole package was about 40 kilograms. The robotic arm, the, the existing one is about a kilogram. Uh, it can lift it up to a kilogram uh, and then it can move. So mainly this was made for very small objects like, like you know, a robotic hand with, uh, with small uh, objects lifted. Uh, I'll show you a camera over there. We are working with another company. Uh, they are based in Minton uh, Elementium. They're developing 3D scanners. So we have been putting their 3D scanners. Soon we'll be releasing some videos on that. Uh, our tiny ML or uh, cloud. Uh, both have a lot of limitations. Uh, why uh, why cloud has limitations? Because this robot has to work in an environment where even if, if the internet goes down, you cannot ask your warehouse manager, hey, internet is down today, so our, our robot is not. Uh, those industries, they are very, very busy. They, even if, if your robot is not working for 30 minutes, the next thing they're gonna say that we're gonna cancel the contract. So we the way we develop this technology that everything is packed up into this platform. So we, we have to do all the processing, uh, into the platform. However, when it comes to the learning, of course, we are using certain uh, platforms, uh, certain heavy duty computation for, uh, to, to train our models. But to execute those models and to, to basically process all the, the real time data, then we, I'll show you some of the examples. Uh, all of the, the processing, has, processing has to happen with the computers into the platform. And when that happens, then another challenge that we may not have enough power actually because these robots, of course, they can lift a lot, but they have very limited power because these are mobile machines. So that's that's another um, uh, challenge uh, when we are working with robots. Unlike AC power, you know, a lot of AC power is available. We have uh, uh, cobots or robotic arms, and you can do, uh, you don't very much have power. I think there was a question earlier. Yeah. Can you turn um, and the uh, samples? Uh, what senses? Like background sensors before sensors. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so because we are not dealing with hands or other papers, but uh, we are already working with so many different partners and this specific company, they are looking into tech so that even if they go and touch a patient, for example, tell your patients, there is a big demand, uh, not just in Alberta or Canada, but throughout the, 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 the world that the doctor is here and you can send a robot into a rural uh, community center and the patients are there and a doctor can basically you know, touch a patient and feel how their pulse is there. Even they can do ultrasonics and all of those. Um, and so tactile sensors could be part of that. Uh, they haven't done it so far. I think this is a part of their agenda. 
Uh, they are uh, they have uh, a very creative team and they are uh, they are totally on to the hands and uh, however there is there is a need of integration of very sensors uh, onto the hands hands i mean the, our hand has a lot of limitations you know, after looking at these robotic hands we realize that our hands have so much limitation we need to have eyes into the hands so that i touch and i can really see it we need to have sensors into the hands so that i can before touching i can find what the material is so there's so much limited with our hands. So this is where the, the motivation is that bring the you know, the robotics hands so that they can, uh, through AI, they can do the data processing in real time. I mean, it is not that oh, I, 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 I recorded all of the data, I took all of the measurements, it's being sent to the cloud or some other computer, the data is coming back. There's not literally enough time for that. So we need to do it in real time. Uh, good. Uh, inspecting industrial equipment. Another application of our robots. So another company that are manufacturing turbines. So we have been um, piloting some of the robots with them. And now this this specific environment, just like I showed you another example of that, um, that the robots are moving boxes. So this specific environment is also full of different autom uh, manual and repetitive tasks, which means they need to clean the floors. Plus they need to develop the 3D models of the machinery because they, as they develop these uh, these turbines right from this point and they, they put another part, set of parts, another set of parts, they need to bring continuously parts from the start room. Plus they need to take the 3D models as they are developing. So one way is that here they, they train an employee and ask an employee and uh, basically distract them from the regular job that now it's time for us to take, take a 3D model. They are literally considering to put the robots to do the 3D profiling of the machine. So that means that now the robot has to be intelligent enough through various levels of learning that it can come to a certain distance of, a, of an equipment and it can take, it can go around and it can, it can even get data that what is the stage of the equipment development and it can take 3D model according to that. And you see, this, this was fairly complex uh, equipment, but these robots are not just going to take the 3D profiling, but they're also measure the, 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 the different parameters. I'm going to show you one of the important parameters is temperature, how much the heat is being created into a regular industrial environment. Like this is, uh, these are turbines. Uh, uh, similarly, um, any kind of moving machinery, forklifters, compressors, engines, um, refrigerators, there are so many facilities they're running there, uh, they're uh, deep freezers. So all those equipment need to be profiled and that, that cannot be done literally just by having one employee and uh, whose job is just to take the camera because that, that specific person needs to be intelligent enough that they go there to an equipment, they measure the temperature and then they report back if there's an anomaly. So that, that is the level of intelligence which is required in these machines. Um, another video over here, uh, this was uh, a robot we asked is literally just to move around. There's a 3D uh, LiDAR over here. This was mainly just to profile the environment, not the uh, not the robot itself. The robot itself has got lighters right at this point and one on the other side. And uh, I think there's another example coming up. Uh, we got very limited time, but another example coming up there. I'll show you some of the examples of the sensors on this robot. So let's run this video and see what's happening. So this this robotic arm has got a, 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 a thermal camera. We call it EcoSense. It's a combination of multiple cameras and uh, sensors. So this, uh, we asked it literally now it's, now it's aligning this camera and then it's going to align the whole thing. And then the whole point was that it should scan the environment just like this. And so yeah, so now it's, um, it is the, literally the robotic arm is independently moving around where the, where the platform has just stopped. So all of these movements are pre-programmed but there would be a stage where someone does not need to pre-program it. They, they, they literally can speak up to the robot and ask that, hey, I need to scan this environment. Can you, do it? Can you go and do this? That's all. Now the next whole processing needs to happen through AI. And I hope we, we're gonna release that technology in the next couple of months uh, where uh, we'll be uh, combining uh, different uh, analyses uh, with the robot. Uh, yeah, so now it was just, uh, reflecting the camera back. I'll show you some of the examples of this, uh, this specific camera. There's a, I think there's an image coming up on the next slide, uh, but I just want to finish this specific uh, video over here. Uh, I think I cannot jump over here. Yeah, like this, it has detected back, and there you go. 
So now it's starting to get. So yeah, this is kind of an example in a in a, in a busy environment, an industrial environment where uh, uh, this kind of machine needs to go throughout various different assets in a company, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in an industry, and then they need to perform different tasks. Okay, so this is a, one of the products we are we have developed so many different products, but uh, Ecosense. Uh, this is a camera which was loaded on that arm. So what it does is it has got a thermal module, it has got an optical module, it has got a tiny uh, microphone. So it can get close to any equipment and it can take three different parameters of the equipment. And one of them is basically how much noise is being created by some equipment. If you go to some, some bigger uh, manufacturing environment, literally there's a lot of noise, a lot of vibrations, uh, fields are being uh, created and some of these equipments have regular emissions. Uh, so this 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 whole package uh, through this 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 uh, the, the special product we developed that can basically give get a good sense of what's happening. So I have some examples over here. That was uh, my set sitting at about five distance five meters distance, pretty far, and then we we used so it was able to detect myself as, as because we trained it that how our people look like. I mean, I'm sure many people over here would understand this part of the machine learning in detecting objects. And then the thermal image. So how well a thermal image basically, uh, you see, uh, of course, uh, it's, it's very basic camera at the moment. However, we are uh, putting a lot more resolution into this. But even from five meters, it could detect heat of uh, my head over here and heat of this TV screen. Uh, plus, there was some other object I uh, don't uh, remember what was that. So, however, in, a, in an industrial environment, it doesn't have to be that far. It can, it can really be trained to get very close to the equipment and do something like this. So, our uh, CTO he was just standing at a bit of uh, distance, about one meter, and you can see the resolution is much higher. You can see uh, various um, parts uh, of his body who, which are basically at higher level than the other ones, and you can see. Uh, object identification effort. However, this was just like a demo as an example, but in, 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 uh, in industry, we don't need to detect humans. Of course, we do need to do when the robot has to make certain decisions, like should I go close to someone, should I perform certain tasks or not? But more than that, we need to detect various parts of it and how this specific part is doing it. It means that there's a blade spinning, and whether that blade is spinning or not, whether that is a blade or not. Uh, so there are so many different uh, examples. Uh, if it goes close to Mm, uh, compressor, for example, it needs to identify whether that the equipment is really there or not. So, so these are some of the examples where uh, we are using uh, heavily using machine learning uh, and various other aspects of AI to teach our robots like how different objects look like. And uh, our next goal is basically to start working on the thermal injury and uh, do detection of uh, industrial equipment through that. Okay, next thing. Predicting robot failures. Now, these these machines are on the goal um, all the time. They have certain goals set. They need to just basically keep rolling all around, and they need to uh, track how the goals are being achieved. So that means they are mechanical. They have uh, certain aspects of failures. Just any mechanical uh, equipment or uh, any any technology would fail. The robots also degrade over time. Their the parts need to be replaced, and then there is a regular maintenance. But imagine a robot is working in an environment. Suddenly, you find out. That it is not operational today. That means that downtime, downtime is very expensive for the operator. So for that, we have uh, installed over 25 sensors inside the robots. These, those sensors are continuously monitoring data. And I think uh, every seven, eight seconds, they're sending one data point to the server. And they are continuously updating the server with the data from various different aspects of the robot. So, this is, a, this is an example, uh, just for um, certain confidentiality reasons, I will not tell you what this specific data is, but that's also not very important for you people to know over here. But what is important for you to know over here is that there are the profile of the data, but how different events are happening into this data. And now you see, this was just one, this was just a couple of days back, the second, three days, this was basically for two full days, but there's, the data density is quite a lot. Of and how we can use this specific data to predict when is how the, the different parts of the robots are this can be, uh, downgrading or uh, having some sort of wear over there. Uh, let me just show you. If I just focus over here, you see 
there is a, there's a really clear event because all of these tiny peaks, they are not tiny actually, they have got so much uh, data in, in close, but this is where I'm trying to focus over here. So for about um, 7 to 7.30, you can still see, but I, I can further zoom in and I can literally zoom in down the seconds. And you see this each peak is in an event happening in that specific moment. Now, how this specific uh, trend can be set actually, let me just give you another example. Uh, there you go. So we focused, instead of focusing on this tiny peak, we focused on this one. And then we just focus further on this one and do further focusing. And you see those bigger peaks, uh, they disappear because they were having a lot of encapsulation of the data. And now you see this specific events from this single sensors, from a single robot, there are over 1 million events happening per year. And our robots are mainly made for 10 years. So you can see that if the if the, if the AI has to basically analyze each of this event and find out that you know, this event was probably related to this one, but this is related to someone else. So there's so quite a bit of interrelationship. Plus, there are 25 sensors from, for each robot, and thousands of robots are going to be deployed across the world. And you, you can see the level of data which is coming in, and then the, the machine learning which we need to adopt over there to basically analyze that's going to be really huge. But the, the 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 scope of insights is going to bring to to us as well as the operators. We would be able to predict beforehand how soon a specific part of a robot is going to fail, and before it really fails, we're going to go and replace them so that the downtime can be literally ignored at all or can be minimized. And so I think I have another example from a different sensor right over here. You can see a certain trend just like the last one. There are certain regular trends all over here. You see these trends and you see these trends. And let's focus over here and find out what's happening, what kind of data profile we have. You see, we focus over there and we expanded it and then further focus down to the seconds. And you see there are certain events happening at that specific profile. Now, people over here were sitting um, in the crowd. It could be an interesting problem for you because these kind of machines are producing quite a bit of data. And we need to analyze each and every event so that maybe there is some information hidden in that specific event which we basically ignored uh, in the past. Era. But you see, this was um, uh, 23rd, uh, so this was about whole week actually. Yeah, this was, this was the, I think this is one day that I'm another day, but each day you can see over here that if you zoom in and more and more and more, you can come down to the seconds. So that's the kind of the data which we are collecting and imagine the level of um, insights is going to uh, produce for us. Okay, uh, yes, I think I am pretty much done. I think I have another uh, interesting photo coming up of Minister Brian. He came to us uh, sometime back. He was excited about the robots and uh, he had a selfie with the robots. So, you know, even at the government level, um, people are really excited uh, what our company is doing. And um, what we are after is uh, making robotics and AI affordable and accessible for those companies, those smaller companies who are not like Amazon, but are really something to start with, who are really small businesses, and that they still need to increase their efficiency. They need to increase their uh, safety level for their employees. And that can only be possible through automation. But historically, they need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on the robots, whether it's uh, the, the, the annual maintenance contracts or upfront costs, there, there was quite a lot which we needed to do. And with our robots, literally they can have multiple functions in a single platform and still the cost about 10 opportunities. And this is where uh, we are trying to get into the industry.